Welcome to the Barnes Children's Literature Festival 2020 at home. Now we've got an amazing author lined up for you right now. We have the amazing Bar Jack Poor Books, the wonderful novel Phoenix, proud Blue Peter badge holder, fantastically talented, all round lovely guy, SF Saeed. Hello. Shall we get cracking then, Suzanne? Oh, I think we should. Yeah, I think we should just say a quick hello to everyone watching all the primary schools I've seen down the side, St. Peter's and Russell School and Bishop's Road School. Lots and lots of really exciting people watching. So I think, yeah, ready to get cracking whenever you are. Awesome. OK, well, um, hello, everybody. Um, I am SF. This is a book I wrote uh, called Varjak Poor. Some of you might have read Varjak Poor. If anyone's read Varjak Poor and you're on the chat, type, I've read Varjak Poor. If you haven't, I think you can probably guess from the picture on the cover, it is a book about a cat. What you may not be able to guess straight away is it's about a cat who does martial arts. Varjak is a cat who dreams of becoming a great warrior. And in his dreams, he learns a secret martial art that is known only to cats. I wrote another book about him. This one is called The Outlaw Varjak Paw. Has anyone had a chance to read this one yet? Some of you have. I can see that is amazing. Katrina, uh, if you haven't yet read The Outlaw Varjak Paw, I think you can tell from the cover, he's still a cat. He is still doing his martial arts, but his dreams of becoming a great warrior have got him in very big trouble because in this book, he is declared an outlaw and he is wanted dead or alive. There is one more book I've written that I'm going to be talking about today. This one is called Phoenix. Has anybody had a chance to read Phoenix yet? If you haven't, I think you can tell from the cover. Nothing to do with cats at all. Uh, this is a whole new thing about humans and also aliens because Phoenix is a great big space epic set across a whole galaxy and the main characters in this story are a human boy who has the power of a star inside him and an alien girl who is the most brilliant warrior in the entire galaxy. Now I'm going to be telling you more about my books uh, and how I came to write them and everything but first of all I want to talk to you a little bit about a book that I didn't write myself. Uh, I want to go all the way back to when I was at school just like you um, my mum came to me one day with a book. She said, I've just read this book. I think it's the best book ever. You must read it. And she handed me an enormous 500 page long book. Well, my heart sank as I looked at this thing. Uh, she must have seen the look of fear and panic on my face because she immediately said, don't worry, if you don't like it, you do not have to read the whole thing, but give it a go. Try page one, see what you think. All right, I said, I opened up this enormous book. I started to read, and from that very first page, I really could not stop. This is the book, Watership Down, by a writer called Richard Adams. It's an amazing, epic story about rabbits trying to survive in the wild. Now, I grew up in the middle of London. I don't think I'd even seen a rabbit in real life at that point. Uh, and as I started to read this book, it seemed that the rabbits were nothing like anything I had imagined. They were not like uh, the sort of heroes I was used to finding in a story. They were not mighty warrior ninja rabbits. They were not superhero rabbits or magic rabbits. No, they were just rabbits, ordinary little rabbits. And actually, they were surrounded by animals that were much bigger than them, much stronger than them, often animals that were coming to get them. And it seemed like everything in this world just wanted to come and get those rabbits. And just to survive in that incredibly 
dark and dangerous world. Those rabbits had to be so brave. They had to be so brilliant and cunning and resourceful. I remember reading this book thinking, how are they going to do this? How are they going to live? And as I read Watership Down, I thought to myself, my mum was right. This is the best book ever. One day, one day, I would like to try and write something that is even a little bit as good as this. And I believe that my life changed forever at that moment, because ever since then, that is what I have always wanted to do. I feel that book changed my life. Films can also change your life. TV can change your life. Comics can change your life because all of these things are great storytelling forms. Um, I saw a film when I was about 10 years old that completely changed my life. I, it might have changed some of yours too because that film is still very popular. And in fact, there have been many sequels and spin-offs. Has anybody out there ever seen a Star Wars film? Ah, of course you have. Everybody in the universe has heard of Star Wars, even if they haven't seen a Star Wars film. But if you were to get a time machine, uh, go back to the year 1977, when I was 10 years old, uh, you would discover uh, nobody had ever heard of Star Wars because that was the year the very first Star Wars film of all was released. They now call that film Episode Four: A New Hope. Hmm. Don't let this fool you. There were no episodes before that one. Uh, it really was the first. And back then, they just called that film Star Wars. I remember going to see it with all my friends. We had no idea what was about to happen. The lights went down in the cinema. And then that first starship appears on the screen. Huge, huge ship. Much bigger than anything we'd ever seen on TV. So big our seats were shaking it was that loud. I remember just looking up at that ship and thinking, yes, one day, I want to make something like Star Wars. I want to make a story that is so big it could fill an entire galaxy. I want to make a story like Watership Down that is like a, an epic myth but set now. Stories, I think they are the best things in the world. And those are some of my favourite stories of all time. What are your favorite stories? I'm always really interested to get recommendations from people. So if you're following along on the chat, um, just type in what was what, what is your favorite story? What do you guys like to read? I'll have a look afterwards. I love getting recommendations. But whatever your favorite is, whether you are a fan of Harry Potter, uh, if you love something like Diary of a Wimpy Kid, if you love Star Wars, however you feel about that, that is exactly the same as the way I felt about things like Watership Down, Star Wars. Writers are really just readers who take one more step and write a story they want to read themselves. That is all any writer does. That is all I do. I am just somebody who loves stories a lot and decided this is it. This is what I want to do with my life. I would like to dedicate my life to trying to make stuff like this. I only had one small problem. I had no idea how to do it. No idea at all. Um, back then when I was at school, uh, we never had authors coming to schools. We didn't have festivals like Barnes. Uh, it just didn't happen. You never met authors in real life. Uh, so like many people, I guess, I thought, how hard can it be? The writer probably thinks up the best idea they can. They write their story from the beginning to the end. Uh, they reach the end. They write the words, the end, very triumphantly. And that's it. The story is done. So the first time I tried to write a book, that was what I did. I thought up the best idea I possibly could. I began to write. I worked on it every day from the beginning to the end, chapter by chapter. I reached the end after about two months. I remember thinking to myself as I wrote the words, the end, very triumphantly, ha, ah, I've written a book. It only took two months. That's amazing. I'm going to send this to some publishers. They will surely clamor for my signature. I'm going to be rich and famous. Here we go. I sent out the book. Every publisher I sent it to gave me exactly the same answer. They all said, no, no. They said, we do not want to publish your book. It's no good. Can anyone guess how many rejections my first attempt to write a book received? It wasn't one or two. It wasn't three or four. It was 40, 40 times I sent that book out and 40 times it came back. No. Well, I thought, what can I learn from this? I think I can learn that publishers are stupid. 
Obviously, they have no idea what they're doing. Never mind. I'm just going to write another book. It will be even better. Here we go. So the second time I tried to write a book, I gave it everything. I worked all day, all night. At the end of only one month, I reached the end of that story. I wrote the words, the end again. And I thought, yes, I've done it again. I'm going to send this out. They will surely say yes this time. And maybe they will apologize about the first time. I sent out the book. Exactly the same. Another 40 rejections. We were now up to 80 rejections in total. 80 times I had sent a book out and 80 times it came back. No. This was really difficult. This was really depressing, demoralizing. People who cared about me, like uh, my friends, my family, they were getting a little worried about me. And sometimes they would just sort of come up to me quietly and say, look, it's all right. We we love your stories. We think they're good. But maybe this idea that you have, that you can get a real book actually published, maybe that isn't realistic. Maybe you should forget that and do something else. You'll be much happier. Well, I thought maybe I would, but there isn't anything else I really want to do. This is it. This is my dream. It's the one thing I've always wanted to do ever since I read Watership Down. I have to keep going. I can't give up. I must persevere. But maybe it is not the publishers who are being stupid. Maybe it's really me. Maybe I should do some research, find out how real writers actually do it. And so I finally did what I should have obviously done in the first place. I did my research. Because I think if you have a goal, a dream, whatever it is, whatever you guys want to do, the most useful thing you can ever do is to read about how other people did that thing before you. That will give you some idea how to do it yourself. So I tracked down interviews with writers that I loved, filmmakers I respected, people like George Lucas, the guy who made Star Wars. Really interesting. All these people, when they talked about writing, one word came up every single time. Not a word I expected, not a word I'd even really come across before, but a life-changing word nonetheless. The word was drafts. Sometimes they said it might take you a number of drafts until you make your story absolutely brilliant. As I say, I'd not really come across this idea of drafts before. Uh, for anyone here who's not come across it, I just wish someone had talked to me about it a little bit before I started, because that would have saved me a lot of pain. Uh, but here it is. Very, very simple idea, and yet very, very powerful. The first time that you write something, whatever it is, it'll probably have really good things in it. But if you don't treat that as a finished book, you just treat it as a first draft. Then put that first draft away. Go do something else. Read some other books for a while. Then come back read it again. But this time, here's the secret, really. You have to pretend you did not write the story. You have to pretend somebody else wrote the story. And why not? Go all the way. Pretend it is a book you just bought with your own money. You just saved up £6.99 and you have handed it over to read this. That will make things super clear. Because I think every time you do that, every time you buy a book with your own money, you are secretly hoping this one this could be the best one you have ever read. This one could be as good as a Harry Potter book, a Jacqueline Wilson book. This one could be as good as Star Wars. And if the thing you are reading is not as good as that, you have got to find ways to make it better. You have got to go through it again and again, as many times as it takes, until the thing you are reading is so brilliant, you really cannot see any possible way it could be improved. Oh. I thought to myself as I read all these interviews, OK, well, this this is not what I've been doing so far. But if this is the truth, if this is how George Lucas made Star Wars, the amazing thing it is, fine, I am going to try it. Sounds like a lot of work, but what do I have to lose? OK, it was about this time something completely different happened in my life, a very ordinary everyday event. I'm sure this has happened to lots of you guys. We got ourselves a pet. We got ourselves a little kitten, in fact. Now, this kitten, he was very, very young when we first met him. He was only a few weeks old. He was so tiny, he could actually sit in the palm of your hand. He had never been outside in his entire life, always been indoors. I will never forget the first time he went outside because it was really dramatic. 
He went out into our garden and at the bottom of the garden, there was a high wall, hundred times bigger than he was. But before anybody could stop him, this tiny little kitten went right up to the wall, coiled himself up like a spring and then exploded and ran all the way up the wall till he was sitting on the top. You could see him there with his eyes enormous, his ears sticking out, his whiskers trembling in the wind because he could see the whole world for the first time ever. I just thought that is amazing. A cat goes out into the world for the first time ever. What is going to happen to him? I am sure many of you have guessed this is where Valjapur began. It began with me looking at my own cat, something anybody could do. I remember sitting down to write a story about a cat going out into the world for the first time ever. I worked on it every day from the beginning to the end. I reached the end after about two months again. But this time, crucially, instead of thinking, oh, that's great, I wrote a whole book and it only took two months, I thought that's not a whole book. That's just a first draft. That is all I've done. I put the first draft away. I went and did some other things. Then I came back. I read it again. But this time, I thought, now remember, I didn't write this story. Somebody else wrote this story. And actually, I just paid £6.99 to read it. Okay. I open it up, I start to read, very confident. It was terrible. Oh, no, I thought, what's this? This isn't a real book. If I had paid money for this book, I would want my money back. I would actually complain. I would go back to the bookshop and say, look, I'm sorry. I think this writer had a good idea. The cat climbing the wall, this is exciting. But I would like something exciting on every single page of a book. Where is all of that? Sometimes I would like spooky, strange, mysterious things in a book, things that will make me think a little bit. Where is all of that? Sometimes I want silly, funny things in a book, things that will make me laugh. Where is all of that? This writer should have done more. Well, the moment I thought that, what choice did I have? I was the writer. I had to get to work. I went all the way through the story of Varjak Paul, just trying to find any way I could to make it better and it got better but when i read the second draft i still thought no there is no way i would pay money to read this thing i've got to keep going so i did i did three drafts four five i think it was around the fifth draft of the varjack pool the idea of a secret martial art known only to cats began to take shape this martial art was called the way of jalal there were seven skills in the way, skills that would give a cat great power, skills for fighting, skills for hunting, skills with names like slow time, moving circles, shadow walking. None of that was in the first draft of Varjak Paul, or the second, really only about the fifth. But I thought this secret martial art was very, very interesting. I wanted to know more myself. So I kept going. I kept writing. I did six drafts. Seven, eight. I think it was around the eighth draft of Varjak Paul that I met this character for the first time. Her name, anybody guess? Sally Bones, the thin white cat with one ice blue eye, boss of the meanest gang of street cats in the city. You definitely did not want Sally Bones to be your enemy. And it seemed that Varjak had just made her his enemy. But I thought she was very interesting, Sally Bones. I needed to know more about her. So I kept going. I did nine drafts, 10, 11. When I read the 11th draft of Varjak Paul, OK, I think I see how this draft thing works. Is this as good as my favorite stories of all time? Is it as good as Star Wars? Of course not. Not even close. But so much better than anything I've ever written before. I'm going to take a big risk now. I'm going to send this out to those publishers. Let's see. Maybe everybody in the world will reject me again. But if they do, I am not giving up. Took a deep breath. I sent out Varjak Paul. Another 10 publishers rejected it, bringing my lifetime total of rejections to a truly horrifying 90. But then unbelievably, the 91st publisher said yes. Yes, he said. I really like this story, Vrissen. Uh, I like it so much, he told me. I am going to publish it and you are going to do some more drafts. More drafts, I thought to myself. More drafts? Uh, thank you, I said out loud. Thank you so much for wanting to publish my book. That is amazing. But... I've actually done 
11 drafts already. I've never, ever worked so hard in my whole life. I don't think I can do more. Hmm. He said, yes, no, I can see the hard work you have been doing here. That is why I'm saying yes. All I'm telling you is I think there could be more in your story. I think you can make your story even better if you just do some more drafts. I think I hate this publisher, I thought to myself, but he was the only one who had ever said yes. So out loud, I just said, OK, I'll do some more drafts then. I took it away. I looked at it again. He was right. Yeah, I did 12 drafts, 13, 15 in the end. In the end, it is really embarrassing to admit this, but this book, Bar Jack Paul, this is actually the 17th draft of the story that I wrote. And in the end, those drafts, they took about five years of my life. Now, if you had told me at the beginning, OK, it's going to happen. You will get your book published. It will happen. But you may have to spend five years doing 17 drafts of one story. Still want to do it? I don't know. I don't know what I would have said. Who wants to do that much work? But I am so glad that I did it. I'm so glad that I persevered and did not give up. Because when Valjack Paul was finally published, after all those drafts, all those rejections, something really amazing began to happen. People started to read it. It won this thing called the Smarties Prize. Now, I always thought the Smarties Prize, this would be the best prize you could possibly win. First of all, it's the Smarties Prize. I thought if you won that, free lifetime supply of chocolate, obviously. But more importantly, the Smarties Prize was very unusual because it was voted for by actual readers. Every year, up and down the country, people would vote on what their favourite book was. And the year Val Jack Paul was published, it won the gold medal. It was unbelievable. Uh, People were coming up to me saying, we really love Varjak Paul, but we do have to know one thing. What happens to him next? I was already thinking about this. I was already working on the outlaw Varjak Paul. Now, this one, this one took 11 drafts. That's still a lot, but I thought it was better than 17. And it took me three years to write the outlaw Varjak Paul. But I felt that was an improvement on five. I thought, OK, I must be getting quicker. I must be getting better at writing. I did everything I could to make it as good as the first one, if not a bit better. Because just as a reader myself, I really hate it if a sequel lets me down. So I put everything into it. So even if you hadn't read the first one, you could just start here and it would be a great book in its own right. As I say, 11 drafts, three years. But this one ended up winning the Blue Peter Book of the Year Award. I did not think anything could possibly be better than the Smarties Prize, which incidentally do not come with one single free Smartie. Uh, but when Blue Peter show up in your kitchen on a Sunday morning, giant TV cameras come to film you for the BBC and they actually give you a Blue Peter badge. No, that was incredible. Now, when I finished The Outlaw of Arjack Paul, I thought to myself, OK, I am sure I'm getting better at writing. I am sure I'm getting quicker. I would like to do something bigger now. I would like to attempt something much more ambitious. I would like to write a great big epic myth of a story set in space, something like Star Wars. That is what I want to do. Phoenix is the result. Now, I thought I was getting quicker, didn't I? Varjak Poor took me five years. The Outlaw took three. So I thought when I started this book, two years maximum. Seven years this one took me. Seven years, the longest yet. But it really was worth it in the end because it is the great big space epic I wanted to read myself. I would like to show you guys a short film in a moment. Uh, this is a book trailer that my brilliant illustrator, Dave McKean, has made. He's the guy who did all the pictures in Valjapur and also in Phoenix. Uh, and he's also a filmmaker. So he's made an amazing adaptation of chapter one of Phoenix using his own illustrations that he's animated and brought to life. I'm going to show you this in a moment while I'm showing it to you. Have a think about questions. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a thing that says, ask a question. Stick your question into that uh, and we will answer your questions in a few moments. But right now, um, I would like to show you the Phoenix book trailer made by the brilliant Dave McKean. If we could get this full screen, please, Richard. Ready, 
Chapter one of Phoenix, the beginning of the story, go. Lucky dreamed of the stars again that night. He loved the stars and dreamed about them most nights. A million points of silver light shining in the black. But this dream was different. This time the stars were calling him. They were trying to tell him something. They were making a small, soft, silvery sound, like the chime of a faraway bell. The sound grew. It surged and swelled, rising up into the sky. His blood surged with him. His feet lifted off from the floor. And in his dream, Lucky flew. He rose up and soared through space into the stars and constellations. He rose higher and higher until the sound wasn't distant anymore. It was all around him now, surrounding him with waves of overwhelming power, though he still couldn't grasp its beauty. If he could just get a little nearer. He reached out his hands to touch the stars. And woke the violent start. He was in his bedroom, in his mother's apartment, back on Phoenix. A headache throbbed behind his eyes. Then he saw his sheets. The top sheet on the bed was burned. There was a massive hole through the middle of it. All around it, the white linen had gone black, crumbled into ash. So that is the beginning of the Phoenix book trailer. Um, I hope you guys will give it a go. Uh, if you have read Valjack Poor, it might sound very, very different. Um, if you read the book, you will cross the entire galaxy with Lucky, the human boy, who you saw there literally dreaming about the stars. You will meet the alien girl I mentioned at the beginning, Bixer Quicksilver, who is the most brilliant warrior in the whole galaxy, but who really just wants to make peace between humans and aliens as they travel together this human boy and alien girl discover humans and aliens have much more in common than they ever knew and together maybe they can even save the galaxy as i say it might sound quite different to varjack paul uh, but in a way the humans and aliens maybe they're a bit like the cats and dogs in varjack paul at the bottom of it all it's really just another story about characters who have dreams goals ambitions like we all do things they really want to do Okay, um, I would love to answer some questions now. I really enjoy hearing people's questions. Suzanne, um, would you like to have a look at the questions and maybe pull some out? Who, um, who's who got a question? Uh, yes, we have absolutely got some questions. Oh, do I need to be minimized again? Do you want to pop me back in the corner, Richard? <laughs> um, yeah, we have had um, over 100 questions. Wow. Um, so we're... Uh, Thank you. Keep asking questions. Them, but yeah, keep them coming. We'll keep an eye on them. Uh, the first question is from Year Six at St John's Lemsford. They like studied Star Jack Paul last year, and they'd like to know what was the inspiration behind the name Varjack. Oh, what a great question! Thank you, Year Six. So, my own cat was called Varjack Paul, so I named the character after my own cat. Uh, now, you might ask, why did you name your cat Varjack Paul? That's quite an unusual thing to call a cat. Um, well, it really just came out of a mishearing of a line in a film. I was watching a film uh, called Breakfast at Tiffany's, and I misheard a line as Varjack Paul. And I thought, oh, Varjack Paul, that's a great name for a cat. We should get a cat and call it Varjack Paul. And then I started to think there could be all sorts of other paws. You could have the elder paw. You and it really just went from there. So, um, yeah, I understand that there are some um, languages, I think possibly Polish, in which uh, variak means something like warrior, which obviously is highly appropriate to a story about a cat who dreams of becoming a great warrior. Uh, I wish I could say I knew that when I picked the name. I totally didn't. I had no idea. It was just the name of my own cat. So that is why Varjakpur is called Varjakpur. Amazing. What a great little um, anecdote. Um, so we've got another one from a school here. I think, um, excuse me if I mispronounce it, Stain City School in South Africa. Um, they would like to know who your favourite author was when you were a child. Wow, my favourite author when I was a child. Well, definitely uh, Richard Adams, who wrote Watership Down, would, would be one of them. Uh, because Watership Down 
was my favorite book then, uh, as I mentioned, still my favorite book now. I've reread it a couple of times as an adult. I reread it for the first time when I was 35 years old, just after I finished writing Varjat Paul. Uh, I was actually going to interview Richard Adams uh, for an article I was writing for a newspaper uh, about his work. He was in his 90s at the time. He was very, very old. Um, and as I looked at this book for the first time since I was a child, I was stunned at how deeply this book had gone into me. It had really shaped the way I saw the world, thought about the world. Um, I, I really think the books you love when you are young, they are the most important books of all. So you guys, if you love a book right now, whatever it might be, hang on to it. Uh, read it again in 10 years, 20 years. I reread Watership Down every so often. It's really interesting. It seems like the book is different every time you read it. Well, of course it's not. It's exactly the same object. Um, you know, you can even see this cost 50p when I first got it. That's how old I am. Um, but the thing that's really changing is you. So the books, if you if you feel favorite books, hang on to them. They kind of act like a, a memory for you. They remind you of who you were, what you were like, what you cared about and loved. So hang on to them. They are some of the most precious things I have. I only have about five or six books from my childhood that I still have, uh, but they mean so much to me. So whatever your favorites are, hang on to them. Okay, let's have another question. Fantastic. Um, okay, so this kind of follows on from that one. Anita uh, would like to know, what do you think makes a really good book? Anita, um, what do I think makes a really good book might be totally different to what you think makes a really good book uh, because everybody is different. Every reader likes different things. The best advice I've ever heard about writing, write the stories you want to read yourself. That's it. You know, um, don't even think of yourself as a writer. Just think of yourself as a reader and then ask yourself, if I could have any story and I really mean anything at all, what would it be? What do you secretly most want to read a story about? You might want to read a story about your pet. Uh, if you do, you can totally write that. You might want to read a story about uh, stars, supernovas, ancient gods coming down from the sky in a great war in space and a wolf that eats the stars. If you want to do that, you should write Phoenix. Um, whatever you want to read, you might want to read a story about footballers uh, winning the Champions League. Write that. Whatever you would most like to read, you write that yourself. And then that will be the best story for you. If you really love it, other people are going to love it too. So don't worry about, will this be popular? Will it be successful? Will it be good? Don't worry about any of that. Just really try and write the story you most want to read yourself. Make it as good as you would want a story to be that you had paid money to read. Remember, you paid £6.99 to read it. Uh, and keep going as long as it takes, and you will write a great story, I have no doubt. Thank you for that brilliant question, Anita. What else have we got? Um, OK, we've got one from Morgan here. Um, and they have asked, how, are the characters in Phoenix inspired by people you know? Oh, what a great question. Um, I think all the characters in all my books probably start out being inspired by somebody I know or perhaps some aspect of my own self. Um, but as you work on them more and more, they sort of begin to change uh, and they become themselves. I think that's the best way of putting it. Um, they, they begin to take on their own kind of character in a way. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. There are characters in Phoenix uh, who started out based on on people I've known in real life. Uh, Mystica, uh, the uh, the amazing grandma, the coolest grandma in the universe. She is the star talker. Um, well, she was actually based on one of my own grandmas who really was very cool. I liked her very much. Um, and... Uh, as I worked on it, though, she began to really take on her own characteristics, her own powers, if you like. Uh, and I think that's what happens with characters. You know, however they start, if you keep working on them, keep trying to make them better, um, then they eventually become themselves. Um, it might surprise some of you to know Sally Bones, you know, as I say, she only really appeared around the eighth draft of Varjack Ball. What was there before that? Well, there were two gangs in the city. And the boss of both gangs was like the biggest, toughest, strongest Tomcat. I started to get a bit bored of this. I said, I think this is the same character. And actually, the boss is not always the biggest or the strongest, is it? Sometimes uh, the boss is the most ruthless or the most cunning or maybe the one who knows an amazing secret that gives them power over the others. 
And Sally Bones is all those things. So I really kind of came by Sally Bones just by trying to push the character further, make it more interesting. But yeah, Sally Bones kind of started life as a big, strong tomcat. And then because I didn't think that was all that interesting, she eventually evolved into the Sally Bones that we know now. Um, and I think that's how writing works. You've got to keep going. And eventually they really do become themselves. Impossible now to imagine Sally Bones different. Uh, but that's it was a process of evolution. Um, incidentally, if anybody is interested in knowing more about how I write in this business of drafts, um, I made a resource for the British Library earlier this year. You can see it on their Discovering Children's Books website, where I shared the first page from seven different drafts of Varjat Paul. So you can see seven different versions of the opening. Uh, and you might find that a really interesting thing to look at because draft two, which is the first one I, I share, I never ever show anyone my first drafts because they are so terrible you would laugh if you saw them. But I, I have shared my second draft. You can see just how different it is. And I think that shows you, uh, I think anybody can write a really good book. You just have to keep going at it again and again and again. Okay, what else would you guys like to know? Um, okay, so I think one of the main things that lots and lots of people have asked um, is, are you working on any other books? And is there going to be a Varjak 3? Wow, okay. Well, there are two really good questions there. Um, I am working on another book right now. Um, I've been working on a book for seven years and five months. So this is the longest I've ever worked on a book so far. Uh, the working title, I think the title, it's pretty definitely the title of this book, is Tiger, but T-Y-G-E-R. The reason for this is it is inspired by my favourite poem. Uh, have any of you guys ever heard the poem that begins, Tiger, Tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night? It's an amazing poem by William Blake. Uh, it was my favourite poem when I was at school probably still my favorite poem now. I love it. It's about a tiger and many other things, including, I think, the idea of infinity. Blake was very interested in the idea of infinity. So am I. Uh, I love the idea, particularly, that we now have in science. So there could be an infinite number of parallel worlds. I love that idea. Have you guys come across it? Perhaps you've seen it in um, His Dark Materials, Philip Pullman's amazing books, Northern Light, Subtle Knife. They were on TV uh, over Christmas, or perhaps Mallory Blackman's Noughts and Crosses, amazing series of books in which she imagines a world in which history went very, very differently. So Tiger uh, is a book set in a world that is quite different to ours, and it's about a boy, a girl, and a tiger. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I've been working on it for seven years and five months. I'm on draft 15A. I've started to use letters as well as numbers to try and make the numbers a bit less embarrassing. But yeah, uh, draft 15A. I don't know how much longer it will be, but everything I know from my previous books, the best things often come very, very late. Um, so when I was writing Phoenix, if you've read the book, you'll know that there are these sequences through the book where these characters called the 12 Astraeus appear, and they're sort of singing in space about something called the wolf that eats the stars. Every so often the story just kind of stops, and you get these very strange kind of mythic beings who are kind of starry and yet there's a bit of a mystery there and you have to put it together yourself what's really going on now that didn't exist until the seventh and final year of writing phoenix uh before that i did have the idea of the 12 astraeus i had scenes where the characters talked about them and there was information about them but it was never exciting enough uh, mysterious enough wonderful enough uh the idea is stars are alive. The aliens in the book believe stars are alive and sometimes they come down from the sky and walk among us. When they do we are dazzled, we call them gods. They think all the ancient gods in all the mythologies go back to the same 12 stars who come again and again. So that is uh, what the 12 Astraeus are. They are those ancient gods coming again and again through time. So um, I love that idea but to make that work I had to find a way of doing it. And I think these sequences of the 12 Australia singing in space, that is how that works. So this is a story full of ancient gods. If you guys like Greek and Roman, maybe even Egyptian or Mesopotamian mythology, you will find all of that in the book. But it wasn't in that form till the seventh and final year. Varjak Paul, probably the most shocking thing I can tell you. Do you guys know these two black cats who show up at the beginning of the story? Two black cats. No one knows who they are. 
what they're doing. We just know something mysterious is going on. These two black hats did not exist because I hadn't thought of them until the fifth and final year of writing of Arjan Paul. You know, uh, that all the drafts I thought were good that I sent to publishers, they didn't even exist yet. The space that they now occupy was completely empty. Imagine that. Very hard to imagine, isn't it? But that's how it is with books. You have to keep going and going and going. So that's what I have to do with Tiger. I have to keep going until it is the very, very best I can possibly make it. And I know it's not quite that yet. I really want it to be amazing. It might be very good but it's not quite amazing yet. So I've got to keep going until it really is. Uh, and it takes as long as it takes to do that. And I'm willing to do that as long as it takes. Because even though I do complain a lot to anybody who will listen about how difficult I find writing and how long each book takes me, when I look at the books I've published so far, I don't actually want to change anything. They are as good as I could make them. They really are. I went as far as I could. And that is a very, very satisfying thing to feel about your own work. Okay, there was another question in there, which is, is there going to be a third Varjak Paul book one day? This is probably the question I'm asked most often. So I will be delighted to answer this question for you. The answer is, yes, there will be a third Varjak Paul book one day. Hey. <laughs> You're right there, thank you. However, uh, it probably won't be very, very soon. And this is the reason why. In the first book, Varjak is a kitten. He is a very young character and he is learning the secret martial art from very, very old cats, like the Elder Paul and Jalal. Okay, in the second book, Varjak is uh, a grown-up cat now. He's really an adult cat, and his problems out there in the world are very adult problems. So it makes sense to me, in a third book, it's going to come full circle. Varjak will now be a very old cat himself, and he'll be trying to pass on the way, the secret martial art, uh, to some kittens, trying to teach them everything he has learned in his life. That makes sense to me as the shape of a trilogy, the shape of a life. We all go from being young to being adults to being old. The only thing is, I think if you're going to write a story about an old character, you probably need to be old yourself to know what that really feels like. And although I am getting there much quicker than I ever thought possible, I don't quite feel old enough yet to write that story, but I am making notes and uh, it will happen one day. So look out for that book one day. Uh, but in the meantime, Tiger is very much where I am. Okay, what else uh, would you guys like to know? Um, well, we've had um, quite a few people have pointed out how amazing those shelves are behind you. So um, where are you sat? Where? What a great question. Um, so this is my study at home. Um, this is where I keep my books. And it is where I am currently writing Tiger. Uh, I was working on Tiger uh, just before uh, doing this broadcast. So, yeah, normally I don't work here. Normally I go to my local public library where I really like to work. Um, but obviously libraries are closed at the moment. You can't do that. So I'm working at home. Uh, and, yeah, these are my books. You can't actually see all of them. Uh, there are quite a few more kind of in front of the camera and underneath there. And so, yeah, I do have an embarrassingly large number of books uh, in my world. Also a lot of comics. Uh, I'm currently reading this amazing collection of Thor uh, from the 1960s. So uh, I, I still really, really love comics. I think they are incredible so um yeah all <laughs> my stuff is here and uh i think it is a nice thing whether it's a library or a study for you to be surrounded by books when you're trying to make a book yourself it's quite inspiring you can think to yourself okay i might be struggling now but if i just persevere if i just hang in there and keep going one day tiger is going to be one of those it's going to be a book up there on the shelf just like varjack was believe me there were times i wanted to give up you know, I thought it would never happen. But I do honestly believe perseverance is the single most important quality you can have as a writer or as anything, really. Whatever you guys want to do, persevere. Don't give up. Remember, I had 90 rejections before I got my first book published. I, I honestly believe if I could get a book published after all that, you guys can do absolutely anything you put your minds to. So persevere, keep trying to improve any way you can, keep trying to learn and get better and you will get there in the end. Amazing. Okay, so I think we've probably got time for a couple more. I think we're sort of on the edge now. Um, so uh, one of them, I've a lovely question from Nicola Watson. What's the best question you have ever been asked? 
a very meta question there. <laughs> Watson, that is the best question I've ever been asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's fabulous, isn't it? Amazing. Um, and Emma has said, um, what is your real name? Or is it really SF? Yeah, yeah, it is. That is my real name. They're just my initials. Um, I use initials because my name is Arabic. My family is originally from the Muslim world, uh, from places like Egypt and Iraq, uh, places like that. I came to live in London when I was two years old. Um, and so I have Arabic names. If you speak Arabic, they're very easy to pronounce, uh, very ordinary names. If you don't speak Arabic, you will never, ever be able to say them right. And I know this because when I was at school, nobody could ever get my name right. So I thought, just be easier for everyone if I use initials. But it turns out a lot of my favourite writers actually use initials. It's quite a writery thing to do. So uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings, used initials. C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia books. Obviously, J.K. Rowling, although I did it before she did. But yeah, it is my real name. Um, I just use initials uh, for people who can't speak Arabic. Um, amazing. So I think maybe should we do one more question? Yeah, let's have one more. All right. Um, okay. Stephen has asked, which is your favourite Star Wars film? My favourite Star Wars film is still that first one that I ever saw, uh, that in those days was called Star Wars and is now called Episode Four: A New Hope. I still love that film. I think that's an amazing, amazing film. I, I don't think they've made better ones. Uh, I, as some of the sequels and prequels, I, I can't say I have any affection for at all. But uh, yeah, that first one, still brilliant. I just see uh, Katrina Johnson talking about Lord of the Rings. Um, I think the Lord of the Rings films are fantastic. I love those films. But I think the books are even better. So if you have enjoyed the films, uh, read the books. Books are incredible. They are so democratic. You know, when you watch a film, it tells you everything. What the characters look like, uh, the music is constantly telling you what to feel, all the places are fully imagined for you. However, when you read a book, you do all that in your own head. So when I say to you, a cat climbed the wall, every one of you is seeing a different cat in your head, and every one of you is seeing a different wall and you're imagining the climbing differently, each in your own way. I think that is amazing. That is something like magic. Uh, I think books are the closest thing that human beings have actually got to magic. Um, so although I really, really love movies, um, I feel like books, they're, they're just such a wonderful form to be working in as a writer. Um, we have been trying very, very hard to get movies made of my books. I've been working with Dave McKean, who, as you saw from the Felix book trailer, is a brilliant filmmaker in his own right. We've been working very hard to make a Varjak Paul movie. Um, I hope it will happen one day or perhaps uh, a TV adaptation. Um, we'll see. Uh, it hasn't happened yet. We've had many adventures in Hollywood and beyond. Um, I hope it will happen one day. But even if it doesn't, I love the fact that everyone can make their own Varjak Paul movie in their own heads just by reading the story or listening to somebody read the story, a parent, a carer, a teacher, a librarian. When someone reads a story to you, an amazing kind of magic takes place and happens. So I, I love all that. Um, thank you to everybody who's tuned in today, everyone from all the schools, everyone at home. It's been awesome talking to you guys. Um, um See, and I hope you don't mind me just cutting in here. Just one last really good question. Yeah, yeah, go for um, it. Which character from your books are you the most like? Which character from my books am I the most like? Yeah, couldn't well, let it go without asking that. <laughs> that's a good question, isn't it? Well, I mean, I don't think I am very much like this character. The gentleman. At least I hope I'm not. Um, and I don't think I am very much like Jalal either. I'm not an incredibly wise ancient cat. Um, but maybe, oh, and I hope I'm not too much like this character, although on a bad day, you never know. Uh, but I hope I am a little bit like Barjack Paul. Sometimes I might feel like I'm cowering underneath a speeding car as it drives over my head. That is sometimes how I feel when I'm writing. I think, oh my God, this is terrible. But if I hang in there, I can get there in the end. And I think Barjack's biggest quality well, his two biggest qualities. One is perseverance. He keeps going. And the other, he does have an open mind. You know, when Jalal says you must have an open mind, Varjak is able to think beyond 
things. He's able to go beyond everything he's ever been told about dogs, about other cats to make friends elsewhere. So I hope I'm able to do that too. So thank you guys uh, for your amazing questions. Uh, if you have uh, more questions um you can always tweet them to me on twitter uh or get your teachers or parents to tweet me more questions on twitter uh it's always great to talk to readers there but it's been awesome talking to you guys today if you've not yet read my books i hope this has made you want to read one of them um if you have already read my books um maybe read them again you know what i've read each one thousands of times and i've been told by a number of people that Actually, in some ways, they like them even more the second time they read them because they can kind of see everything that's coming. So um, happy reading to you all. Happy writing. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival and uh, check out some of the other amazing people uh, who are talking today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, SF Saeed. Um, that was incredible. We had some amazing questions from school from people all over the world that last question it was from america we've had questions from south africa oh it's all just been absolutely incredible so thank you so much you know you, you won't be able to hear it but i'm guessing everybody at the moment is cheering and shouting um so everyone enjoy the rest of the festival we've got loads of events coming up um so uh, yeah take a look at our website and see if there's anything else you'd like to sign up up for and yeah i think that's everything isn't it um once again thank you for joining us he has been sf saeed i've been suzanne curley and this has been the barnes children's literature festival okay bye